be standing for our invocation by our very own Archbishop Lionel E. Brown Jr. Today is a very different type of day 
although it's commencement and our regular candidates will receive their doctoral degree, we have a second part where we will be conferring degrees upon our archbishops and the HCOC. And so you'll have a chance to see both of those ceremonies today and their involvement. Our candidates are really unbelievable. I've worked with them now, and I need to clear this up because I've heard and I've seen a couple letters in my package. This is not an honorary degree. On an honorary degree, you must put honorius casas, which mean honorary. I mean to give it to you because I like it. This degree, you have to work for and you pay for, both of them. Work experience will get you here. Now, mind you, they must have their undergraduate training both on the bachelor and master's level. And so we're talking about their research later on in the program today. They're going to be able to defend their papers. They have to write a dissertation. And now they have to, we're only giving them three to five minutes to defend. But they're ready. I know they're ready. You know, and, 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 and interesting about this graduating class is that they are working as a unit. I've seen them communicating. They've called me if they're not sure. And so this is a great day. And I don't want to take a lot of time, but I want you to know this is a great day. We have the founder of the institution here today. He's going to be our orator or our commencement speaker. So it's a great day. And I'm glad you're here. And so I'm going to sit down now, and I'll come back later. God bless. Give God a high praise. Time we will hear from four of our dictatorial candidates. They are coming to defend their dissertation. The program states that they have three to five minutes to do so. All of them are preachers. So we are trying to hope that they don't feel the preacher on them. It's so difficult. I keep telling people it's very difficult to be at a graduation of a Christian college and not wound up in church. Look at somebody and say, because this is what I know. But we have some of the greatest minds in this graduating class. Let's give them a hand. Doreen B. Figueroa. Bishop Tracy Anderson. Reverend Doreen B. Figueroa, Doctor of Arts and Religious Studies. Bishop Tracy Anderson, Doctor of Divinity. Bishop Pamela D. Herbert, Doctor of Theology. And Dr. Jermaine B. Parrish, Doctor of Musical Arts. Receive them as they come in that order.
control. I said, God is still in control. I don't care what it looks like. I feel the presence of the Lord. I feel the presence of the Lord. We give honor, amen, to all of these great men and women of God, to Dr. Timothy Cole, Dr. David Billings, amen, and to Dr. Robin King Smith, and to my husband, Archbishop Eric Figueroa. We all pray for him. He's, he's so upset that he can't be here today. But we know that God is in the healing business. Hallelujah. And to all of these great gospel persons, we're so grateful and so thankful. And to all of these wonderful graduates, amen, I am uh, honored to be numbered among. God is good. Amen. 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 Our scriptural reference for my dissertation can be found in Acts chapter 1. Verses 1 through 8, but because of time constraints, I'm only going to read verse 8. Acts 1 and 8. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And the word is blessed. Amen. Aren't you glad that we serve an all-inclusive God? He doesn't leave anybody out. Hallelujah. If you take hold of this gospel, this gospel will take hold of you. And this gospel will give you power. Mark 13 and 10 says, And the gospel must first be published among all nations, because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And my dissertation theme would be power to the people. Yeah. Look at somebody and say power to the people. To there you go. I see some of y'all. Y'all come from my era. Hallelujah. I see the fist raised. That's how we used to do it. Hallelujah. Back in the 60s. Hallelujah. I'm a 60s baby. Hallelujah. And power to the people was a cultural expression and political slogan. Hallelujah, that had been used in a wide variety of contents. During the 60s in the United States, young people would begin speaking and writing the phrase as a form of rebellion against what they perceived as the oppression by the older generation. Hallelujah, the power movement arose in the Philippines to out Ferdinand Marcos. The Pakistan People's Party has as its creed, Islam is our faith, Democracy is our politics, socialism is our economy, and all power to the people. Hallelujah. The Godfather of Soul, James Brown, and John Lennon of the Fabulous Four both wrote songs entitled Power to the People, which reminds me of my radical days. My days when I had my big afro and I had everything I had had to have red, black, and green on it. And when me and my friends would greet, we would raise our fists and say, power to the people. I remember those days so well. Hallelujah. Those words, power to the people, invoke many feelings. Different feelings to different people. Hallelujah. But I want you to know there is a power. There is a power like none other power. Hallelujah. And that power comes from our God. Hallelujah. We have inalienable rights, God-given rights. Hallelujah. And I want to talk about another power, a power that brings change. I just preached a message called Thank God for Change. And in our women's conference, we talked about champions of change. And if you're going to have a change in your life, it's going to take some power. Because some of us are wrapped up in things, wrapped and tied and tangled up in things that we can't get loose from. But the power of God, hallelujah, I can't get a witness in here, the power of God can dispel any hold that the devil might put on you. It's a power that enables you to give up the things of the world and follow Jesus. I'll take Jesus for mine. Anybody know I'll take Jesus for mine? You can have the whole world, but I'll take Jesus for mine. Hallelujah. The power God who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly 
Miss Danielle Hall asked the question, where do I go when nobody else I can turn to? Who do I turn to when, I, when no one wants to listen? Who do I lean on when no foundation is stable? And she turned around and answered the question herself, I go to the rock. Y'all understand, y'all see that that's what, I, what I mean. I go to the rock because he is able and he is stable. I go to the rock. The rock uh, is the ultimate source of strength. And like I said, over the past two years, people everywhere have been looking for strength, have been looking for direction. And we make an off often made a mistake of looking for help in all of the wrong direction. But in 2 Chronicles 32 and 8, with him uh, is the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God. And God will help us to fight our own battle, fight our battles, and the people rest. Folks are still searching for someone to put their trust in. The Bible said in Psalm 20 and 7, some trust in horses, some trust in chariots. But I will remember the name of the Lord. So Ms. Daniel Hall was right in saying, I go to the rock. For those who need help and are seeking uh, someone that they can confine in, uh, they can look to the book of Mark 10 and 47. Uh, it reads on this wise, give rise, and it gives rise to the idea that the people or bystanders that are watching, and it was talking about a blind man, uh, and, and, and when he had called on Jesus, the Bible said that Jesus stopped because he heard his cry. And when you call on Jesus, he will answer prayer. Y'all don't want to talk to me in here. I heard the one that said, those that were sitting around him said, listen, you ain't got no right to call on him. You're dirty and you're out of order and you ain't got this and you ain't got that and you don't have the other. But let me tell you, Jesus is not worried about what you got on. Started something. Jesus heard him and heard his cry. And while he heard him, he called him, said, Bring him to me. And, and, and uh, there's a hymn uh, that I love. He, one of these hymns, the songwriter J.B. McKay uh, asked the question Is there anyone can help me? One who understands my heart. When the thorns of life has pierced me, I got it. Until we meet one that criticizes with us who wonders love in part. The blessed Savior, he's the one. And every, and even this songwriter got happy and answered his own question. And he said, yes, there is one. The blessed, blessed Jesus, he is the one. When affliction press your soul and the waves are trouble roll, and you need a friend to help you. He's the one. He's the problem solver of today's year. If folks started with the vaccine, but it's more than the vaccine. It's in Jesus. Our past governor said, uh, it was us, we did this. But I beg to differ with our past governor. It was because Jesus made it possible. And people are trying to leave 
without Jesus in everything. But I come to share with you, if you leave him out, there is total destruction. Uh, I got one more songwriter, and he wrote a song. My God, help me through here. Uh, uh, if, there, if there could be, and I was reading in the book of Genesis, uh, Adam and Eve would tell you about the time that they successfully, that they tried to successfully leave God. But I'm come to tell you, my friends, uh, once you leave God, the only way you can go is down. And I couldn't figure this out because uh, it said in the book of Genesis uh, that their eyes, uh, both of them, were open and they knew that they were naked and saw and sewed feet together and themselves with apron. They lined themselves with apron. And Adam and his wife hid from the presence of God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Bible said that the voice of God, the voice of God just grew legs and went walking through the garden, saying, where are you? The question of the day is, where are you? Who do you trust in? Who do you believe in? Well, if I was going to take and answer that question, I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord until we die. He's the one that woke me up this morning. He's the one that started me on the way. He's the one that gave me activities of my name. He's the one that turned my life around. David, a man of prayer who trusts in God totally, turned and turned to God for an answer in 1 Samuel 30 and 7. And David said unto Abathar, the priest, uh, the, the Ahimelech son, bring me the ephod. And Abathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? I know we're in COVID, but look at somebody and say, Shall I? You can only do the shall I until you say, May I? You got to say, May I? You got to ask permission. And this is for those of you that want to do it on your own. Uh, he said, shall I? In other words, he was talking to his daddy. Daddy, shall I? Go after this, this truth. Shall I pursue this truth? If you tell me go somewhere and sit down, I'm going to turn around and sit down. But I got one question, daddy. Shall I? Too many of us, we pray and ask God, but we don't wait around for the answer. So I don't know about you today. Every step that I take, every voice, every mess that I'm messing with, I ask God to help me. Can I turn it around? I feel you. I'm God for time is up. But I will trust in him. I'll lean on him. Amen. Because he will turn it in my favor. If I got five of you that's standing, just turn around and say, Give me the right. Just turn it around in my favor. He's going to give
his children, the memory of my father, who my sainted spiritual father, Archbishop of Spain, who we lost last year. This is a great pandemic to all of those who are here in virtual. I just want to take the opportunity to say I am so grateful for this opportunity and for this time. To my mother who is watching, Mommy, this is for you. She is indeed my hero. I was born in this place in Manhattan. We left here when I was four. She raised me in Chicago alone, a single parent, working at Ford Motor Company 13 hours a day, going to school, raising me. Amen. And she was determined that the streets would not get me. I was determined that I wanted them. Through everything that I went through and everything that God delivered me from. Today I want to talk about the efficacy of time. If I must take a scripture with me, Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Certainly if I can just take this opportunity to thank God for one of my oldest and dearest friends and the reason that I am here today, Dr. Bishop Fabian Tucker. I love you. I thank God for my ministry team that goes with me everywhere. I love y'all. Do we have that high water we got here, right? Mark 1, 15. I love you too, Jiggy. I hear you at home. I hear you all the way. He is my prince. He is nine years old. He is a child of my old age. All right. If that's not Jesus, please turn your phone off. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is in hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Efficacy is a Latin word recorded in around 1520 to 1530, denoting effectiveness, success or successfulness, productivity, fulfillment, potency or power. Time, we know it is a noun made from the English word in the year 900 in the old English time. It is a limited period or eternal. It is between two successful events. It can denote a long time. It is a particular time considered from other periods. It can be uh, as in a time of youthfulness. It is considered in some places to be, uh, our youth can be our best time. Time can be articulated. Time can be accounted for. It can be avoided. It can be given away. It can be kept. Time can be cheated. It can be misused. It can be miscalculated. It can be misinterpreted. It can be misunderstood unacceptable, it can be unescapable, it can be always in the forefront even when the time is not on our minds, yet always leaving us but we are very cognizant of the fact that Father Time, as some of us would call it, is always in my present presence which is forever with us. It is my determination today to prove to you that time is not only a precious gift, it is a most omni, uh, omnipotent commodity. But to answer the question that the late great American musician, William Everett, AKA Billy Preston wrote, he wrote a song penned, Will It Go Round in Circles? <laughs> The earth as we know it is said to rotate once every 23 hours and 56 minutes and 4,953 seconds. 
is called the side rail, period, and in its circumference is roughly 40,075 kilometers. Thus, the surface of the Earth at the equator moves at a speed of 460 meters per second, or roughly 1,000 miles per hour, and orbits around the sun at a speed of about 60,000 miles per hour. Yet, do we feel any of this motion because the speed is constant? Such is time. Time is constant. It was in the beginning and it is eternal. It has moved in circles so swiftly that we have witnessed things come and go and come again. Some have witnessed clothing like bell bottoms, the Afro puffs, the curl. We witnessed it come and go. Some of us had curls and it left. Ah, some of us glory to God and it will not come back. Some of us have witnessed, we have experienced what seemingly was social, economic, and political deja vu, while even others declared the more things change, the more things stay the same. Or is it? Will it go round in circles? Will time repeat itself? Or shall we look for another? Will our great grandchildren of 2121 have to have to contend with yet a different strand of pandemic? Or our great grandparents did they have to contend with the influenza? Will the of the influenza of 1918? Or will there be another 100 years that will bring about a generation of people who are divided in their thinking as we have been in this, con this country or this century and as those of Exodus 32 because they exemplify pre-microwave timing and God's time was not their time? We will go around counterclockwise, circular, because we are on a different time frame than God's time. Ah, I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, it's time that we begin to exude the same type of unity as the analog clock. No matter whether it is unplugged or the battery does not work, it's unified and it is right even if it's only twice a day. It always goes in one direction. It never loses time unless it is a, a power outage. If the power goes out, simply recharge by plugging back into the power source. I'm not just talking about the analog clock. I'm talking here to you, child of God. If you go out, if your power plug goes out, simply recharge by plugging back into the power source. It's not the failure of the power source, it's more than likely a temporary delay in time lapse from an atmospheric deterrent. We must exemplify a First Chronicles 12 and 32 mindset in this era, being as the children of Issachar, which were men that understood the time. Ah, we must know what to do, not just for our children or our families, but for our communities, for our cities, for our churches, for our next generation. It is imperative that we step into Kairos, a noun a used to represent a fitting season or opportunity or occasion, and stay there, dwell there, Yeshua there, rest there, cloud there. Come on here. We must understand he was before time. God is calling us to Mark 1.15. The time has come in my closing and now is here that we must, glory to God, stay there, rest there in the efficacy of time that he must bring, we must bring the earth back to a unified body 
of believers for his kingdom with this type of unified, effective utilization of our time, we will win the loss, feed the hungry, open the blinded eyes, unstop the deaf ears, destroy the kingdom of the enemy of our souls. Glory to God. Somebody say the efficacy of time. With the efficacy of time, we can see as John saw a new heaven, a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea according to Revelation 21 and 1. So with this thought in mind, I have this question for you. Ah, the efficacy of time, will it go round in circles? I know it has. Yeah. 
there is still not a permanent change. Positive thinking, having self-affirmative cards, reading over and over, saying things over and over in your mind does not bring forth that transformation. It is the word of God. When we speak the word of God and we renew it, have our mind renewed daily, we can see that it's bringing forth a change. When you speak the word of God out of your mouth, you can even know for yourself that something is changing. It's power as this is power in the word of God. It's power when we speak the word. It's power when you meditate. David said, when I meditate on the word of God over and over, it's like chewing on the word of God over and over, it makes a change. So when, therefore, when I say positive things over and over my, my mind, it does not bring forth the permanent and transformation of my mind that I need. So when I speak the word of God, I can decree and declare that it's bringing forth change. I remind of my mother, a personal testimony, when my mother was diagnosed with cancer, breast cancer, and she used as her prescription the word of God on a daily basis. She took the word of God as her prescription, as she took what the doctors had given her. Matter of fact, she had changed the mind because she believed so strongly in the word of God that she wasn't even going to take the medication that they gave her. And finally he went to her and said, are you taking the medication? She said, no. She said, no. He says, why not? She said, it has too many side effects. He says, well, would you rather be six feet under? So then she decided, if I have to take this medication, with all the 30 side effects that it has, I'm going to trust God. So she began to read the word of God, speak the word of God, of God out of her mouth daily, three times a day. I saw my mother praying and reading the word of God, speaking the word of God out of her mouth so that it would bring forth change. So I'm letting you know that it's not positive thinking. I'm not letting you know. I'm letting you know it's not affirmations. It's not saying things over your mind that bring forth the change. It is the word of God. Amen. God bless you. Kingdom blessings, everybody. Amen. Hallelujah. I bring greetings. Greet you all. God bless you to our chancellor and to the most amazing spiritual father I have met, Archbishop Billings. God bless you. I want to give honor to Dr. Fabian Tucker. God bless you, man of God. I am Elder Carissa Spann, and I stand today sharing a topic that I've researched, and that is the correlation of religious buildings and how it connects people to God. The main aim of my study is to show how worshipers are connected with their deity. You see, it is going into church buildings that people can have a place to reverence their God. Because in that, they are connecting with their divine, a divine power. So in my studies, I've researched multiple religions. I've researched Christianity. I've researched Hinduism as well as Muslims. I've researched the architectural designs of buildings, if you will. Um, and in that, it was intriguing to me to see how, in my study, I formed a group of people who were of different religions and faiths. They were men, they were women, comprised of being Christians and Muslims. I did that because I wanted to gain a greater understanding in the experience of the religious faith and what people believe outside of what, what I know is Christianity. In looking at the architectural design of religious buildings, I realized how people are drawn to the structure of buildings because it represents, it represents sacredness. It draws people in because they can look at a building and say, okay, that is a church versus a school. And so it attracts people because they realize that there is something connected to what I can physically see from the outside. Examining how people are drawn to buildings, I wanted to understand the greater, what attracts people to the different buildings that they go into. 
You see, because when people sometimes they go into the church house, they have an expectation or an anticipation that they're going to be relieved of the day-to-day -day worries, their fears, their stresses, their anxieties, and all of the vices that they're dealing with in life. They're connected with like-minded people because they need inspiration, they need encouragement, they need hope because they feel hopeless. And in that, many people are excited to connect with others because they realize that something that they're connected to when it comes to connecting with someone else is going to take them higher in their faith. And so I concluded that during my research and during my studies is that people are accustomed to coming into the building, but it's not the building that they're connected to. We can search the four corners of this earth and we will find that the word of God is what sustains and keeps us. It is not necessarily the building. And so even in the midst of the pandemic, churches have closed down. It's no longer church as usual. So to me, that denotes that surely, as much as people believe that they are connected to the buildings, it's not the building. It's God. And so people have had to find a place to worship outside of the building. Was the place that they connected to strong enough to keep them in their faith? Were they deeply rooted at the core or did they need something more outside of the building? So as I bring this to the close here, I just want to share my conclusion of the whole matter and it is this. Attending traditional services in a traditional building, it does not connect people with God. You must have a relationship with God. You must have a relationship with God because I promise you that outside of the church, we are contending with a lot of things. And when the building is closed, baby, you better have faith. Given that many are no longer attending normal services and is no longer church as usual, it is evident that believers do not need a building to connect to God. God bless you.
and how it has affected the community who have not been diagnosed. So, regarding depression, there are 16.1 million Americans suffering with that diagnosis. The family is the foundation of any culture. The main purpose of the family is to provide and protect. With the onset of the pandemic, the ability to feel competent to do so has been grossly impacted. Unemployment has further complicated this matter. With the increase of stress, fear is produced and becomes the prevalent emotion. Anxiety has its core in fear. Depression has its core in hopelessness. So go with me and visualize a ladder. At that bottom round, you have irritation. Then you have frustration. Come up the next rung, and then you have disappointment. Along with disappointment, because it's a pair, it's hurt. So when you have dis disappointment and hurt, you automatically are going to feel what? Anger. If you don't resolve your anger, you go up one more round to bitterness. And if you don't handle your bitterness, the next thing you're going to feel is what? Rage. All of those are emotions. Couple those emotions and it equates revenge. So when we talk about mass shootings, when we talk about people going to businesses and just shooting, we're talking about people who are out for revenge because they have fear and they have hopelessness. But that's the world's perspective. I'm coming from a religious perspective. Anxiety has its root in fear, however God says, he has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and a sound mind. In the Bible, there are 365 scriptures, one for every day in the Gregorian, Gregorian calendar. And it says what? Fear not. The word says fear not. Depression has its root in hopelessness. But the word says that what? Jesus is our hope. God says every sickness, every disease, every infirmity is a weapon of the enemy. The pandemic is a weapon of Satan. However, God says his weapon is real, but it shall not prosper. The issue is that people with anxiety and depression, they don't know or they don't believe what God says is their idea. We are the thermostat in the earth. We change the environment. God gave us power, dominion, and authority. He redeemed us back to the original plan that God had for us. We have the full God in us, so we are his glory carriers. We are his ambassadors. We are overcomers and victorious. We are people who have a voice, just like God. God has the kingdom voice activated. What are we speaking? Although we're in spiritual warfare, I believe God's word. What do you believe? I want to encourage and inspire the class of 2021 to reach one and teach one so that others' faith can rise. Believe in God's word. Establishing a lifestyle to motivate others to stick out God's promise of joy and peace. So in conclusion, God said, Jesus did, I believe it, and that sells it. Amen. <laughs>
1 Corinthians 11, 1. And it says, Mary, be ye followers, imitators of me, even as I also am of Christ. Here, I describe inside of this desertation, which is actually my life, what it is to come to God at the age of 12. At the age of 12, you're innocent. You don't really know anything. My daddy was a doctor of divinity, and so I grew up in the church, so why did I have to be saved? I was 12. What could I possibly be doing at the age of 12? Here it is. I found that I needed someone to disciple me. Who was that? That was my father, who is now deceased, who actually spoke about this graduation six years ago. And so all of you and preached it on his deathbed in CCU. Gave me a 15-minute crash course and said, baby, I gotta go. I'm passing the mantle on to you. Maintaining a Christian life, baby girl, you got to stay in the Word. When Mama and I are gone, there's nobody here but Jesus to take you on in. So can you touch your name and say, just stay in the Word. Stay in the Word. No matter what comes of man, you have got to get down on one knee and begin to call on the Father and tell the Father all about your problem. And sometimes, weary at night when you're feeling low and guess what? And you think that God has not heard you yet. Let me show what you need to do. You need to come on down and prostrate before God and lay down a little bit and say, Oh God, Lord, what happened for such a people that I needed your help that they know God? Lord God, I don't know what to do, but you know what to do and when to do it. Oh God, I'm suffering down here, Lord God. But Lord God, I'm going to hang on to faith without wavering. When you get up, you may not feel any better, but let me tell you about who God is. God begins to shake you and move your mind. He moves in the atmosphere. He grabs hold to your hand and says, I got you.
immediately following this portion of our commencement exercise, we will release you into the hands of Missionary Anisha again, because she will and the praise team prepare us sermonically for the Word of God, which is coming from one of, in my opinion, the greatest minds in Christendom. Nobody said nothing to me. Archbishop Timothy Paul is one of the greatest minds in Christendom. And so I'm, I'm, I am efficaciously dealing with time right now. I'm efficaciously dealing with time right now. So that I don't have to keep getting up. I'm giving everybody some orders. Conferring of degrees, sermonic selection, and then you will all rise to your feet as we receive our Chancellor, Archbishop Timothy Paul, Patriarch, His Holiness of the ICHOC. Come on, let's give God praise. High order. We don't we don't go low. We're high order. High order. 
we believe in the Lord. Who has satisfactorily pursued the studies 
and passed the examination required, therefore the degree of Doctor of Arts and Religious Studies. <laughs> Dr. Ward takes care of me in Maryland. You need to know that that's the end, that's the ending of the class. Now what I have to do, hold on just a moment. What I have to do, I have to pass this to Dr. Ward and let her know that we appreciate her so much. The next In the middle, in the middle of the pandemic, the next young man was given his degree because of a special service. So he's having the opportunity to march with the class, and I want him to come up, the Reverend Dr. Jermaine Brown. Just for clarity's sake, Jermaine is a deacon in the Lord's Church, which makes him a part of the Reverend clergy. All right? So if you hear Reverend Doctor, it's because he is a part of the Reverend clergy of the church. Mr. Phillips knows what he's doing. Amen.
small h period and then a capital D. In this particular degree, it although it's a doctor of sacred theology, when you say it, it's S period, T period, D period. And that stands for sacred theology doctrine. Some of you in the world hook up that STD. I've had it all the weekend. I'm dealing with it. I'm dealing with it, so I'm trying to clear it right now while I'm here in the session. So when you, when, you're, when you put behind your name, you have to put STD. But when you write it out, it's not a sacred theology. God bless you, Archbishop Brown. I will recognize I will recognize one of the sons, my son, here in the gospel in this area, uh, the Reverend Dr. Eric Renal Figueroa Sr., Doctor of Sacred Theology. We ask for him, why did not come up to receive it? Holiness, who is the Archbishop Timothy Paul 
He's a picture of the ICHCOC. Now, here's what's going to happen. I don't know how he did not get his degree when I got mine. However, he didn't. So what I'm asking him to do, I want him to come up here to me. And I'm going to hood him. That's all. Hood you in. I've given the school colors. I'm taking off my hood of the school colors. The president is doing this. Just by way of announcement, I'm asking every graduate that is rolled to please stay back. We're going to take photos, individual photos of you, so that we can have them for our records as the Vice President of University Advancement trying to advance things. I want, I want him to actually put on the school colors. And as soon as he finished, he's giving it back to me after he finished preaching. Thank you. 